Well, hello and welcome to another guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I've got a treat for you. Why? Because it's somebody who is like me, like-minded, works with lawyers on helping their business grow, grow profitably. Uh, Really excited to jump into this conversation to see what kind of nuances we can unlock uh, through the conversation. So I invite you to um, get ready for uh, a great conversation. If you're out for a run, no problem. Uh, you know, just get get clear your head, get ready for 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 where we might go deep in, in talking about business. Uh, but ultimately, when you own a law firm, uh, focusing on the business side of, of the law firm is really what's going to unlock the true potential for you. Uh, so many people start their law firm and their barometer for success is simply replacing their previous paycheck. And that's really not what it's all about. Uh, it's it's really about creating um, an abundance of cash to not only create a life that's that's fulfilling for yourself, but also to have the ability to invest in other places, to create um, your own wealth journey that's outside of the law firm in the in the process of of creating your own success uh, within within the law firm, one of the things that motivates me uh, tremendously is helping you set up, set yourself up for generational wealth, for impacting future generations. It's not just about oh, I want to be able to vacation where I want to vacation. I want to be able to take four weeks off at a time, six weeks off at a time, or even I want to be able to sell off my law firm at the end for a decent amount of money that will allow me to live out my days in retirement. But when you go, when you're done and you leave a legacy for your grandkids, what is that legacy going to be? Uh, and that's really what motivates me every day is to help you create that legacy. So when we're working on unleashing the power of the law firm, we're working on unleashing the power of your ability to generate enough cash to be able to invest in other places that will help you to build that wealth journey for yourself that ultimately will be the legacy that you leave uh, for future generations. Our guest today is Margaret Burke. Margaret is the founder of MB Law Firm Consulting. And uh, let's see, she has decades of experience consulting with lawyers, partners, and small to mid-sized law firms. She specializes in managing operations, finance, HR, IT, and business development to improve law firm operations, streamline processes, and scale revenue. She has advised and led acquisitions, relocations, succession planning, restructuring, and startups. Margaret, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to have our conversation. And See? um yeah, same here, and and I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to have that conversation with us. Um, hopefully, we will, uh, through our conversation, uh, uncover or discover some uh, golden nuggets that you have from working with your your years of of experience with clients uh, to help them in growing their law firm. That will help somebody who's listening to this episode today. What I like to do when we start a conversation is really just get our, let our audience know who you are. You know, we gave you the the intro, but it doesn't really talk about you as a person. Um, so give us a little bit of the background of who you are, how you got into supporting law firms, um, and what makes you an authority to talk on the subject today. Sure. Thanks for asking. And you're correct. You you gave a lot of my professional background. I'll quickly note that, you know, what I do is I work with law firms and I truly enjoy helping. Um, it's typically a founder or a managing partner um, solve a challenge and achieve certain goals that the firm has. Um, my background is prior to working with law firms as an advisor slash consultant, um, sometimes fractional team member. I worked in law firms. Um, my last position was with a firm in Boston as executive director and then as CEO. I was with that firm for quite some time, about 15 years, and I helped start that firm, actually. We broke off from another firm, and I had that experience that many attorneys enjoy. It's a challenge, but it can be very enjoyable of starting a new firm and building something from the ground up. 
Um, how I got into working with law firms is I actually, prior to working in the legal industry, I worked in the financial industry. And at the time, it was um, Smith Barney. So we're going back a little bit. And I worked in a group, estate and trust services, where I worked with a lot of attorneys. So I worked with financial advisors, and we would bring in attorneys as needed to help clients. And as part of that, I really started to get to know a number of attorneys. I started to understand the behind the scenes responsibility of the attorney attorneys we worked with. And I developed a relationship with someone that we referred a I tended to refer business to. He did an excellent job with our clients. And over time, I was offered a position um, to join him and another attorney to help start a law firm. And that's where it all began. And it's interesting because I know we'll probably talk about marketing and business development. And um, it was that relationship that I formed with someone and I respected the service that I saw this firm provided. And um, it was really a wonderful opportunity for me to shift and move into a very different industry. Um, the legal industry is very different from the financial, both professional services, but very different cultures and industries. And I learned a lot from that experience. Um, really, really interesting story. And um, I, I have a similar um, situation where I kind of accidentally stepped into supporting uh, law firm owners uh, just by getting a law firm as as a client and then them referring me to another referring me to another and that really brings us to the first um piece of conversation which is the the value of networking and and referrals when it comes to uh when it comes to law firm uh, growth law firm building the the career path that you take um so I'm curious about your thoughts on this because um a lot of law firm owners they they want predictable results. They want results now, um, and they turn to uh, an assortment of marketing solutions, whether it's paid advertising or SEO or things like that. Um, and I think the art of networking and the art of of building a practice or or a, a component of your practice to come from strategic positioning um, to receive referrals and you know from. Uh, the community at large um, seems to be lost, or 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 something that that becomes difficult to attain for for a lot of people. So, talk to me a little bit about um, where you see the value of that, and and where you think where and when you think a law firm should be focusing um, on that component. Sure, I'll I'll make a bold statement, and I'll say that I think law firms should always be focusing on that as one of the priorities. Um, I understand firsthand from working in law firms for many years and with attorneys that time is a big, um, it's a limited resource, incredibly limited for attorneys in particular. And with marketing and business development, there are so many tools out there that firms can use and resources to help ensure that the attorney isn't spending all his or her time on marketing, but is incorporating that into their practice to keep, frankly, the term pipeline to keep that full um, and to stay in touch with people. You know, I actually, I work with a coach. I'm a big believer in coaches. So um, I, I'm always happy to talk to anyone about that, the benefit of having a really good coach. And, and I had a call the other day with my coach and, and we were talking about time, business development and marketing. And he noted that with business development, marketing, it's when you start to walk down that corridor, there are many doors that start to open once you open yourself to the to the experience of really taking some time and focusing on marketing and business development. And it's very true. I think anyone that has taken the plunge into something that um, is new to them have found that it leads to something else. So I share that because one, there's time constraints. Two, it's very important. And what I see very often with, with the firms I work with, the attorneys I work with, is they, they don't embark on it because they want it to be perfect. And what is perfect, I think to a lot of attorneys, perfect is a very high bar. Like they really want things to be perfect. And as a result, they may not move forward. And it doesn't need to be a full-fledged plan. 
It could be certain things that you do with a component of you enjoying it. So if you like people, that might be staying in front of the top 10 clients or referral sources once a quarter and just meeting people for coffee or having a quick Zoom call. And it could be as simple as that to begin. It doesn't need to be attending every networking event that's happening in your area. So to close the loop on your question, I feel very strongly that every attorney, whether or not they have a client base now or you know, believe that they should have one, really should focus on the client um, bringing in clients because that's actually a tool to help get attorneys where they want to be in the future. Yeah, um, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I, I, I share the same sentiment. I think that there's never... Um, a time that you should not be focusing on the referral side of your business. I, I think that uh, relationships are ongoing um, and uh, and and should be should be formed and and maintained. I do think that as the business grows, those relationships don't have to be you. Um, I think that a lot of people think that you know it's not it's not something that they can grow or expand because they're the ones that are doing it. Um, I recently had a conversation with one of uh, a very close uh, friend of mine um, uh, who's a law firm owner. I'm not going to say his name because I don't I didn't ask him permission to share this story, but we were at a conference together um, and had a conversation with uh, regard to his the growing of his own business. And uh, he said that like you know, pretty much you know ninety to one hundred percent of the the business that they get is by him going to events and meeting other people. Um, that are in his target market and just simply connecting with them and building a relationship with them. Um, and he was struggling with how do I grow the next piece of my business? Like I want to expand into another practice area or another segment of business doing the same thing that I'm doing. Um, you know, how, you know, how do I, how do I do that when I, I simply can't be in all places, um, at once. And, uh, what I told him was, is that, you know, we, we have this assumption that we're the only ones who can make friends. But the reality is, is you can hire somebody who's a really good people person to go and represent your firm, represent your brand and create those relationships and develop those relationships. There's always, you know, there's always that that factor where you're nervous about, well, this person created all these relationships. If they go somewhere else, they're going to take all those relationships with them. And that's valid. But the reality is, is that you can't operate your business out of fear that people that are building something crucial or important within your, your business are going to leave and take it somewhere else. You set yourself up for legal protection, um, and then you just take care of your employees in the best possible way so that they don't want to go anywhere. They're very happy to be where they are. They feel uh, respected. They feel rewarded. They feel valued. And then you're, you don't have to worry about it. So um, it's definitely something to, to note, but I do think that we, you know, we need to think outside the box when it comes to developing this side of the business and, and recognize that one of the reasons that we're afraid to do it is because we're afraid of the commitment personally, and that doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, that was such a great point. And you led into something that's, it's incredibly accurate is on quite often, you know, I'll say attorneys, and I'm sure in other industries also, but we'll focus on the legal industry. They are afraid that when they start to introduce clients or prospects to other people in their firm, what happens when that, that person leaves? Because as we know, in the legal industry, the clients belong to wherever they want to go. They can stay with the firm. They can go with the attorney. And there are times when you can't avoid someone leaving. It could be relocation. It could be a number of reasons. But often, if if a firm really does focus truly on their culture, treating people well. Transparency is really important and it doesn't always need to be, everyone does not need to agree, but if there's a reason something happens and you share it and you're transparent and people feel part of something bigger, they will tend to stay and those clients will stay with the firm. And then as you noted, you know, it, it doesn't all fall on the shoulders of one person. It's a team. It, it builds a, a firm where people are focused on business development, they're excited, they're marketing, and, and they're part of something that likely will really grow into a very successful law firm that's enjoyable to be to be part of. 
Yeah. And I mean, once we start talking about team development, I know that that's an area of focus for you. What are you finding to be the biggest challenge when it comes to law firms um, growing their team or or getting the most value out of the team that they have uh, working for them? I think what what I see often is the way people are compensated can promote certain activities, right? So you want to reward, as an example, you want to reward an attorney who brings in business, right? So that's that's it's not easy to do. And if you have those folks that are good at it, they enjoy it, they bring in a lot of business, yes, their compensation should reflect that. And they're and it's always great to have, you know, those KPIs, right? Like things people work towards. There's also the people that are doing the work, and that is very important. And what I see is over time, compensation structures can actually hold a firm back and can prevent people from joining the firm or can can cause them to leave the firm because they're not um, being rewarded for activities that aren't necessarily origination. So you may... so. I'll back up. So your question was, what do I see that can impact law firms as it relates to talent? And I do think that communication, transparency, but also really taking a look at your compensation structure and what you reward and what you don't, and being aware that it takes a team to build a good law firm and, and, you know, acknowledging the activities of those that maybe aren't originating but are performing in other areas is really important because they very well may leave over time because they don't feel as though they're part of the the A team. Yeah, and I think that that's the the first place is is recognizing that really the key to growing a successful law firm is the team. Um, so many law firm owners focus on the front end. They focus on the client acquisition component. Um, and they they kind of feel like the team is something that's reactionary. We, we evolve the team based on the needs that get created by the clients that, that, we're, that are bringing, we're bringing in. The reality is, is that the ability to bring in clients is created by the capacity that your team has. And um, law firm owners would would be much quicker to success and have a much easier time in building their firm if they would focus on the team first and client acquisition second. Uh, because as you grow your team, the team themselves start to be part of the client acquisition process. They start to um, talk about where they're working. They start to attend events for you. They, you know, they, they become part of the machine that's bringing those clients in. Um, and ultimately the, your desire to acquire new clients is much is, is and, and this is something that's not quantifiable, I don't think, but, um, there's so much emotion attached to the activities that we do as a business owner. Um, and as coaches, we we completely understand that because we work with clients day in, day out and recognize that so much of what's keeping them back, holding them back from, from taking the next step or succeeding is, uh, is emotionally based, not logical based. Um, the reality is, is that you are not going to do everything in your power to acquire a client if you don't feel like you can serve that client, client adequately. So when your when your team is is at capacity or or when you're at capacity, um, you have no desire to bring on a new client other than the financial side of it, um, which creates an emotional conflict, which pr- causes you to not show up in your best form as somebody selling your services to the client coming in the door. They are able to pick up on that. They're able to feel that, and that's going to cause you to not be able to close those clients and bring them on uh, to work with your law firm. When you focus on your team first, when you create that capacity and you step into a sales conversation, knowing that you have the team behind you to fulfill on the most stellar customer experience for them, it is so much easier to make that sale. Uh, And what you're going to find is, is that the clients, there's an abundance of clients out there. 
we're so worried about where is that client going to come from. But if we have the capacity set up, if it's not all falling on our shoulders or there aren't pieces of it that are falling on us specifically, uh, it becomes so much easier to step into that sale and to and to bring those clients on. I recently released, uh, we have a new YouTube channel we launched this year um, and my team will, will put in the resources section a link to this video. But I recently released a video on YouTube called um, how to, I think it's called how to scale a law firm. So I don't have it in front of me, uh, I'm going off of memory. But in there, I talk about the idea that our people on our team are the inventory in our business. And you wouldn't think about opening a supermarket and putting one item on the shelf, mm -hmm. right? When you If you open a store that people are going to walk into and buy things, you're going to fill the shelves with a bunch of different items. You're going to have inventory in your warehouse to refill the shelves when people buy it so that you don't run out. Why? Because if somebody walks in and there isn't something for them to buy, they're not going to buy it. So you're losing the ability to make money by not having it there. Same thing is with our team. If somebody comes in and the inventory to serve them is not there, they're not going to buy from us, right? And we really need to flip the script on how we think of how we think of that uh, as we grow grow the firm. Um, how you keep your team and how you make them happy. Those are great conversations too. But first you need to identify what those roles are and fill and, and figure out that you need to fill them. Now, Margaret, in, in the green room before we started, you you said something about um how uh you know law firms are uh often not putting people in the right seats. So let's talk about that for a moment because I think that uh when we're talking about the idea of a team being so important and, and adding people being so important. Sometimes people think that if I just hire somebody for the sake of hiring them, then I'm I'm full, I'm checking that box. And there's a lot more to it. So, um, what are what are your thoughts about how a law firm owner can can approach um, the hiring process in a way that that they're trying to avoid some of these common pitfalls and mistakes where they might be putting somebody into the wrong role um, or, or filling the wrong role in the first place. Sure. Yeah. I actually um, have done a peer amount of work in this topic. And, you know, we all know that law firms are many law firms that are trying to hire and or retain talent. And during the hiring process, as, you, as firms are thinking about their hiring needs, it's important to look at, think first think about what the, what the need is at the firm, not the title. Like, let's put titles to the side. Like, what is the actual service that this individual will provide? And then as, as firms recruit, again, put titles to the side, look at the skills and abilities and what individuals like to do. Ask those open-ended questions to understand what someone really enjoys. And that's really step one. And so there's job descriptions that give, you know, credentials, but really focus on the abilities and what the person wants. And then step two is being aware of putting too much on one person, especially it's incredibly common in law firms where they will have a few people that are very good. And as a result, they're responsible for everything. And the things that are asked of them are very different. So someone that is really good at financial management and crunching numbers may not be good at HR. It's quite possible that they're not. And you go into a law firm and you'll have someone in charge of crunching the numbers, hiring, firing, culture. Um, technology, and in it's a it's a, a sort of a jack of all trade tendency at law firms, which results in that person that was once excellent and they were happy and they were really good at what they were hired for, being um, disgruntled, burnt out, and leaving. So as firms hire, instead of thinking about an org chart, think about like a responsibility chart, and even take the time to like list out what is needed at your firm to be successful and then plug names in and you'll see where there's no name. And that is what you, you should start thinking about hiring for. And, and you'll also see places where you have two or three people responsible for one thing 
And it will tell a story on why everyone's confused when something doesn't get done. It's because everyone, there's three people responsible. And when three three people are responsible, no one's responsible. So during the hiring process, think about responsibilities. Allow that individual to be really good at what they do. And don't put too many responsibilities on one person. Um, and and I'll, I'll end this section by by sharing, you know, people that work in HR are familiar with there's a halo effect and a horn effect. Um, are you familiar with that? No. That is? So really common. So halo is when someone does something really well, and suddenly you think they're going to be great at everything. So someone's a great business developer. Gee, they're also going to be a really good manager because he or she's a really good business developer. That's not always the case. Horn effect is one person you discover is not good at business development. And as a result, they're not good. <laughs> they're, they may not be able to manage people. They may not be able to contribute to marketing efforts because they can't do this. They haven't been successful in business development. I think it's really important to remember that halo horn effect as you look at the people at your law firms. Quite often, um, being good at one thing does not make them good at everything. And think about that during your hiring process also. Very interesting, um, interesting stuff, and and really, um, what what it, our listeners should be paying attention to is that these are some of the things that you don't think about, right? And and it really needs to be something that you act purposefully on. You have to really um, uh, be um, purposeful in the journey of growing your law firm and making sure that you're taking these steps along the way. Um, we had a, a great episode where we interviewed Craig Goldenfarb and my team will link up a, a, a link to that episode as well, um, where he talked about creating culture and and what he did in, in his law firm to uh, to create create that culture. And when he describes it and you're sitting there listening to that conversation, you almost get the feeling like, wow, I, I would like to work for him. Right. And I was sitting in the seat interviewing him and I had that feeling like wow if I was looking for a job I'd be calling Craig up and saying hey can I can I come work for your firm um and that's really what the place that we want to be is and it's not going to happen overnight you can, you're, you're not going to be able to do what he's doing in your firm 100% at you know if you're at a at a, a earlier stage of growth than him um because some of it requires resources requires capital requires you know investing in your team at a level that you might not be ready for but you can start to think about it in that way you can start to take steps uh, along that path to create an environment of whether it's fun. I mean, you get to decide whether it's fun or serious, right? Uh, you get to decide whether you're going to work your people to the bone or whether you're going to treat them like human beings and recognize that they have lives outside of work um, and create a business model where they're not needing to work till capacity um, and or max or, or beyond capacity, right? I mean, so there's so many stories about big law working people to, you know, 100 plus hours a week. Um, I saw somebody recently posted on LinkedIn, and I forget, I forget who it was. Um, but there was a great post that got a lot of traction, uh, where somebody was decided that they're leaving big law. Um, and they talked about how when, you know, when they when they entered into big law and really started on the partner track, that they brought a sleeping bag to the office and got ready to just, you know, sleep in the office for a few days a week in order yeah. to be able to, you know, to to get to that that golden ticket, right? That that place that the corner office, you know. Um and there's there's so much of that that we carry with us to our own business when we start it where we forget that that's part of the reason why we left our last job. That's part of why we started our own business is to get away from that. Yet we step in and try to mimic and do the same business model that they're doing. So we have to recognize that there's a different way. And figuring that way out is really the biggest challenge of growing your law firm. Recognizing what makes your law firm tick and, and how to value people um, and how to structure it in a way that you get efficiency without creating the life that you're that you decided you know from the get-go that you didn't want to create for your law firm um so that i think that brings us to the last topic that i want to talk to you about and that's the underlying business model 
we we had a little bit of chat in the green room beforehand about hourly billing versus alternative billing models um and one of the things that that really i mean there's two main components that that really um rub me the wrong way with the hourly billing model um one is it pits you against the client right you have uh a, you want to bill the most hours possible the client wants you to bill the least hours possible so right away there's there's a a a relationship of conflict that's created the moment that they become a client um the second component uh is that you're you're essentially incentivized to be inefficient because the only way you bill is if you, your attorney or your paralegal are doing work. So there's no incentive for you to find somebody who's really inexpensive that's perfectly capable of doing some of the work to go and do it because you can't bill that, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can't make as much money when they're doing that work. Um, the attorney holds on to stuff that does not need to be the attorney doing it because the attorney bills more than the paralegal, right? Like, the, and those things are not happening because you're unethical. They're not happening because you're intending to defraud your client. They're they're happening subconsciously because that's the business model that you adopted. And so much of what we create is based on our own experiences and how we stepped into the creation of our law firm which is, this is what I saw someone else doing, right? This is what I saw when I was working for someone else. So this is what I think is the only thing that's possible. Um, so Margaret, I, I want you to, to just broad strokes, talk about your thoughts on the overall model for law firm owners. And I mean, barring a few types of practice areas or, or, you know, like trial attorneys, um, you know, or, or, uh, attorneys that, that do spend a lot of time in litigation where there really is a much harder way to quantify the value of the service you're going to provide. Basically everything else, um, can be done differently. What are your th thoughts on this? How do you think that a law firm owner should approach thinking about the, their business model? Um, and I mean, do you agree with what I was sharing or, or are you at odds with that? I completely agree with what you just shared. And it actually circles back to our earlier conversation about compensation models. So attorneys can be rewarded for their billed hours. And they can be penalized, perhaps, if their billed hours are lower. So that right there is incentivizing an attorney that bills hourly to bill a lot of hours. Um, and it does create conflict with the client. You know, a, a firm can have a client that's very happy with the service and not unusual to get the final bill. And that client, a month passes, suddenly doesn't have a great feeling anymore about the service because they noticed that maybe they were billed for a phone call when they felt as though, gee, we also talked about our family and children. Did they bill me for that? It just creates a lot of conflict and questions. Um, in addition, as we, you know, right now, like legal tech is becoming much more popular. Thank goodness. It's actually an exciting topic. There's a lot of opportunities for firms to be very efficient. Many law firms that perhaps even five years ago weren't embracing, you know, CRMs and, and technology and, and all the other um, tools out there are now embracing it. It's a topic that comes up often. So as firms invest resources, time, and money into this technology, how wonderful is it that they can reap the rewards by billing, I'll, I'll call it value billing. Like what expertise and value are you giving your clients and pricing along those lines versus the hourly rate? Because if you bill hourly and you've also invested in technology and tools, you're not reaping the rewards of, of those efficiencies someone else is. So how wonderful is it to invest, become efficient, provide very high value service and price your services on your value versus the hourly rate. And, and then from the client perspective, if they have an, if, if you have a business client that has um, an event, they're more likely to call you if they know they're not being charged every time they call you. And you can likely save that client a lot of headache and in money just by that person calling you proactively and sharing something that they weren't sure whether or not they should be concerned. Um, and I've seen that. I've seen firms where clients didn't call them. 
And then something turned into something much bigger litigation, which, as we all know, can be a very costly, um, emotionally and financially um, experience. They could have avoided it by calling their attorney early on. And so um, I agree completely that the hourly, yes, there's some exceptions, but as, as a general baseline, I think firms that are looking at value billing and other ways to um, gain a profit and, and be successful financially are benefiting from um, alternative ar arrangements. Have you been involved in in transitioning a law firm from the hourly billing model to an, an alternative billing model like the value based billing that you're referring to? I have. Um, if okay, perfect. So can you can you just paint the broad strokes of what's involved? Um, so somebody who's listening to this podcast is saying, okay, I, I'm doing hourly billing. I I I kind of get you know, why this is not good um, and and why this is something that's more suitable for, uh, you know, a, a, a massive law firm that, you know, is, is just, you know, is structured that way. Um, but there's a lot of potential for me to create efficiencies, have a better experience for my clients, and at the same time, even be more profitable in the, the work that we're doing with our clients by transitioning to a different model. So what 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 are the steps, um, the main steps that required to transition? Because it's a scary, it's a scary move, right? It's it, it's basically changing completely how we do our business, and people are going to be afraid of, well, will I be able to actually pitch this to a client? Will I be able mm -hmm. to get a client to agree to it? Um, you know how how do I position it? And um, so I, I there I think there's there's a probably a pecking order that you've experienced as as to you know, what they need to do in order to move to this model. So if you can give us the the broad strokes of that as kind sure. of an outline uh, for our listeners that they can follow if this is something that they need to do. Sure, absolutely. Um, broad stroke, I'll, I'll start by saying it's an emotional process for firms. They are nervous. Um, there's can be a perception that they can't do a value billing until they know what other firms are charging. A lot of lawyers and attorneys want to know what other folks are doing. And that type of information, I see you laughing because it's so true. That type of information is very hard to get. So there really, as far as I'm aware, and I've actually done a lot of research on this, there really isn't a place to go for um, smaller firms, small to mid-size to find out what their peers are doing other than talking to their peers. So that's I, I, I think I'll jump in real quick because you bring up a really good point. And I want to point out that, first of all, when you start thinking about adopting this, you may be a front runner, right? Like you may be doing something other people are not doing, which gives you a competitive advantage um, because believe it or not, um, somebody who's shopping for legal services would much rather pay more knowing that that's the most they're going to pay than leave it open-ended mm -hmm. with a potential for possibly paying less because they're well aware that that can end up being more. So people want a definitive price. They're willing to pay for it and you shouldn't be afraid to charge for it. Second thing is, is that um, just because somebody else is charging something doesn't mean it's a good amount to charge, right? Either you can make really good money by charging less and that gives you a competitive advantage or they implemented the model incorrectly. They're going to be losing money. They're not going to be able to be successful with the way that they have it priced. And if you follow, you're going to be in the same boat. So really, you need to approach this from understanding. And I'll let Margaret weigh in on, on how to approach it. Um, uh, but what I would do with clients is, you know, approach it from, you know, what it, what it, you, you need two things, right? She, she said, this is value-based, right? So what's the value to the client? That's one component, but then you have to look at your inputs to produce that for the client, right? Like, what is that going to cost you to deliver? Mm -hmm. And if you can't make the profit margin you need to make, then you need to adjust based on that. Um, so Margaret, uh, I, I interrupted you because I, this was a really good point, but carry on. Sure, absolutely. So you mentioned inputs. I recommend everyone tracking their time. So you have an idea of the cost of that input. Um, there are firms where everyone tracks time. There are firms where just attorneys do. There are firms where people don't track time because it's flat fee billing. But then how are you measuring your inputs against 
you know, the, the fees that you're charging. So that's one. Start tracking time if you're not really and have everyone track their time. Um, the next item is, you know, you may consider just doing this for new clients and testing it. And then if you have some trusted, ongoing annuity clients, people you know really well, float it by them, get their feedback. But you can, to, to feel more comfortable, continue with the current billing for your current clients, but look at this for new clients. And the other item is, it goes back to the value, is being, you know, really taking a look at the value. Like, you know, certain engagements warrant a higher um, fee than others. And be open to that. Keep an open mind and try to look at it from the client's point of view. How much pain you are you solving for an individual? How efficiently and quick do you do that for someone? What is your experience? So an attorney that's been practicing for 50 years, they're not just bringing their current role. They're bringing their training and their experience to the table. Quite often, many attorneys are advisors. They're not just doing the legal work. They're actually strategizing and advising. There's a lot of value in that. And really take a look at the, the, the type of work you're doing and distinguish between the um, break and file templated documents from the very strategic high value advising and price accordingly. And once you're comfortable with those prices, be open to increasing them a little bit. Like to, if you feel it's correct and the value is there, um, psychologically, where many uh, folks <laughs> are afraid to come in at a higher price point than they believe um, if they hear their peers are charging less. But as you noted, your peers may not be charging properly. And as a result, they don't have the resources behind the scenes because they can't afford them to provide better service to the clients. So again, track time, be really open with the value and bring in help. It is helpful to have an unbiased opinion at the table with these types of decisions because it is emotional. Um, many attorneys are afraid to lose clients. And so it's easier not to make this change, but bringing help, track your time, really, and and have a process where you move this, this project forward. Like, Meet at regular intervals with deliverables for each meeting by the participants and just keep it moving forward and start with your new clients and to feel comfortable, keep your current clients as is unless you feel they would enjoy the change. I'm just going to add one component and that is to recognize that with this, um, any of, of the, the flat fee models, uh, whether it's value-based, whether it's flat fee, um, it's the law of averages at play. And one of the top things that I hear from law firm owners is, oh, I tried that and I got killed. You know, like I, I, I ended up producing so much work for a client and I didn't charge enough, but because it was flat fee, I didn't get paid enough. Um, and they're taking that one example as a reason why it's not going to work. And that's going to happen for anybody, no matter how well you set this up, that will happen. Um, and what you need to recognize is that this model works through assumptions and we're making our best assumptions and you can tweak along the way. Um, but there, it's the law of averages at play because there are going to be clients where you, where you give them that flat fee and there's a lot less work that goes into it. And you made a lot of money on them. And we don't look at those and say, Oh, wow, we made a killing on that client. Right? Like, um, and it's not, and we almost feel like it's unethical to even think that way. Um, but the reality is, is that, you're providing a service and sometimes that service takes more. Sometimes it takes less um, to, um, uh, you know, to implement that. So uh, just keep that in mind as you implement this, you're not going to get it right on day one. Uh, there's going to be some situations where you feel like you got quote unquote killed, um, you know, serving that particular client. But the reality is, is that if you stick to it and make adjustments along the way, um, it is the only way to unlock efficiencies and also create a great customer service experience for your clients. Um, Margaret, we're we're out of time. We got to wrap up. What I do at the end of an episode, uh, at the end of of an interview, is I give you an opportunity to to answer two questions for us. Uh, the first is, what is one parting piece of advice or wisdom that you'd like to leave with our audience? And the second is, how can they get in touch with you or learn more about you uh, if they enjoyed this particular conversation? And, and and they want to take it further with you. Sure. Yeah, thanks. So my first piece of advice is 
if something, if, if, if you have numerous ch- goals, challenges at your firm, it's not unusual. It, it's a growing pain. It's a sign that there's opportunity there for you. And just start somewhere and look at the, 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 the biggest bang for your buck, the, the area that you feel you can implement and, and just get started. It's back to the corridor. Once you start, you'll, you'll be amazed at how much you can accomplish. It, it just involves developing a plan and, and starting to improve in the areas that, you know, when you're sitting around the conference room table with your peers and the same items come up at every partner meeting, take a look at those items and start to change one of those items and keep it going. Um, the next is how to contact me. So um, one, I want to say it's been a thrill to be here today. I'm very happy to speak with anyone. Um, complimentary consultation, phone call, always happy to brainstorm. Um, my website is mblawconsulting.com. Um, my email is margaret at mblawconsulting.com. And my phone number is 617 702 Two nine. Um, on my website, there's also a link to schedule. If you'd like to meet, I'm, I'm always happy to, to meet. Awesome. And folks, we're going to put that in the resources section of the podcast notes here. Uh, so it should be in your podcast player as well as at profitwithlaw.com. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation and you'll come back again next week. We're here every single Thursday with a brand new interview. Until then, Let's just focus on the profitability of our business, which ultimately will fuel the growth and our own personal success. Take care, enjoy your week, and we will see you next week. 